Hi, uh, so today I am feeling uh, kind of pooped out and frazzled, but I wanted to talk about working with symbols. Um, there's a lot of ideas out there about symbols and symbol systems, um, traditions of symbol systems, but I want to talk today a little bit about that, but mostly about how you can uh, work with symbols in your own uh, magical uh, practice or esoteric explorations. So the main concept that I would like to get across is that symbols, I wrote it down, symbols are doorways through which you can access the energies, abilities, and entities or intelligences who will help you in your magical project. So uh, the idea here is that symbols, now this is going to include like uh, objects, animals, actions. Um, you know, if you perform uh, like a, a banishing uh, pentagram, that's an action, right? As well as tracing in your mind or possibly in the um, instructions that you took that from, uh, a visual symbol written down. Uh, relationships. If you look at... Um, I don't want to say, like uh, Aphrodite as a symbol, as an entity, um, she uh, encourages certain relationships, a lot of uh, fertility uh, gods and goddesses are like this way, or uh, gods of war, they uh, encourage certain types of interactions between people or groups of people. Um, and uh, so that's how you know about their presence. But if you are interested in working with symbols, I really encourage you to think about the symbol, uh, for example, a color, an animal, um, a particular, uh, like a sigil or a word, not so much in itself, but as a doorway through to the entity or intelligence or capacity that's behind that symbol. Um, and that is what you're working with. That is why you would focus on uh, working with that symbol uh, for example, chanting mantra, right? Um, in uh, Tibetan Buddhism, it, this was seen as a way to purify, as it was explained to me by the uh, Tibetan Buddhist Rinpoche that I studied with, um, and also one of his teachers who was another teacher of mine, uh, Judith. It is a way to prepare yourself to align with that energy and tradition and intelligence that is involved in or described by or invoked by that mantra. Um, so there's always this sense that uh, there is an intelligence, an energy, a purposefulness behind uh, these symbols. And I think that that's really important to take into account when you start working with this. Um, now, there are... I see a lot out there, and I was uh, speaking with some, uh, chatting with some people online, and it, there's a lot of these, that, like if you go on Pinterest or something, kind of one-to-one -one or kind of like field guide things, and it's like, well, purple means X, or the root chakra is X color, it has to do with X, Y, Z, so this is kind of like a, like a field guide, I'm, I'm a bird watcher too, and it's just kind of like, ah, this bird has a purple head with <laughs> yellow eyeballs, so obviously it's an X, Y, Z. Um, and these are, you know, obviously they're not written in stone. Um, there are people who just kind of come up with this stuff, you know, out of their own. I mean, that's how all human uh, knowledge has been generated by someone somewhere, someplace. Um, another uh, thing that was brought up, though, is when you start to try and use a particular traditional system, that has been developed in a particular time and place and peoples and in a culture, usually. And then you start kind of tweaking things and um, using symbols in a way that would be inconsistent with the logic of that has been developed in that particular system. It was uh, Anthony Nine online, is a very interesting follow, um, was talking about a TikTok he saw where someone was using, like, I think it was a hoodoo-based type of ritual setup, um, but they had, were using lemons uh, as a way of increasing your money, as opposed to in that tradition, usually uh, the idea is that uh, lemons will sour things or cut through things, which makes sense if you've ever eaten lemon. <laughs> um, and I think that there's a lot of reasons having to do with um, respect for people's cultures. 
um, especially if you're putting it out there and, and he took issue with it, which I think is very fair. Uh, people monetizing this and it's not even an accurate representation of that system. Um, however, here is the problem with uh, magic and esoteric practice, which is that uh, people can do all type of things that are uh, really ill-advised and they'll still work. Different people can do different, uh, have very different takes on symbols or processes or how a ritual should be set up. It will work fine for one person, they'll get great results. Other people, you know, will blow up in their face. Um, it's an individual practice. And the, the thing with meaning, another thing that I like to get across here, is that it you have kind of inherent meaning but then you also have assigned meaning. Uh, I know I've uh, talked about some of this before, but for example, if you have like a, a paramecium, or like a one cell organism, right? Um, or a plant, um, but let's, a plant's probably a better example. Uh, the plant needs light, right? So the plant is sending, is uh, sensing on different parts of its anatomy, how much light is hitting uh, various parts of its plant body, right? Um, so that's information. The meaning is the difference between the amounts of light, right? If that plant wants more light, then uh, it, there's a meaning to the side that has more light to it, right? Its, it's meaning is, okay, I want to go over there. So even in the uh, most primitive, plants aren't primitive, but the most uh, primitive or sim simple, simple setup of organisms, they st there is still this meaning because to continue as an organism, right, you need to uh, acquire certain substances and uh, avoid certain experiences like getting eaten <laughs> or dying. Um, so you can see that uh, meaning is very deeply embedded in the experience of living beings. Um, and we create meaning based on what it is that we're trying to get at as uh, creatures. Um, so if you're looking at, uh, let's say, uh, Tibetan Buddhism, and there is a very uh, developed iconography of the various uh, bodhisattvas, um, for example, Tara, there's 21 forms of Tara, and they all have to uh, do with different things. They'll have different associations, uh, mantra, uh, colors and uh, so on, kind of symbol systems. So if you are working in that system, you're going to want to keep that in mind um, and uh, try and work with, within that system um, to get your results. However, <laughs> and this is a thing that I, I think, um, especially a lot of uh, scholars and uh, left brain people who enjoy reading, which I, I don't enjoy it as I used to because I've had a lot of uh, neurological damage <laughs> through, the, through the decades from various problems, um, which is, you know, when I was living in that uh, Tibetan Buddhist meditation center, there, there was a very strong understanding that, uh, for example, Tara is not just, I mean, Tara is, okay, on one level, you know, this is all just a projection of our mind and we're trying to uh, un grasp ourselves uh, projecting this experience. At the same time, uh, Tara would be an independent entity with her own uh, history and drives and intelligence and capacities. And so if you are trying to activate that in your life, you're going to be looking around in your current experience to see uh, Tara's manifestation possibly in your life. So this means that you are going to be taking your own experience currently and assigning the meaning that this is Tara coming through to you. So if you uh, walk by, if you're working, let's say, with a red Tara and you walk by a florist and suddenly you see that they have, let's say they've had a big order and there's like many displays of uh, uh, red flowers there, you're going to be assigning that as a, a manifestation of, of red Tara in your in your life and say, ah, this is encouraging you in your practice. This is the way that this entity who is uh, discarnate um, manages to manifest into our reality, consensus reality in this way, to show me this meaning that she is encouraging me. Um, so that makes things a little less cut and dried, especially as it comes to personal practice. So what can you do? Um, 
I would say that uh, for me, I, I enjoy my synchronicity experiments and they're, they're definitely all about meaning because it's like how, if you set a symbol out there and try and charge it, how does it come back to you? Um, it does it come back to you through another people, uh, through, uh, other people. Um, how does that symbol transform itself to come back to you? So that can be a really fun way and it's easy to keep notes. Um, to kind of get a practical working of how symbols act. Another way that I think is uh, very uh, useful and practical is uh, start to learn about the ecology in your own area. you are be able to find out, okay, what are the plants that are growing around here? Um, what are their requirements? What are the animals, birds, insects, and so on that are uh, in my area? And how do they all interact? Because um, there tends to be in a lot of talk the idea that, well, uh, chipmunk means, um, you know, I don't even know what chipmunks would mean. <laughs> Quick action, uh, loud voice, even though you're small. Um, ability to uh, gather treasure and manage your resources, right? So you're going to, so there's that kind of one-to-one -one field guide thing. But the way I was taught by a woman who was trained in a number of uh, North American Native uh, traditions is you want to look at, um, first of all, all the capacities that a creature has, right? So if you're looking at like owl, it's like, you know, it's silent flight, uh, the ability to hear and with like a, a radar uh, capacity, uh, very strong talons, um, all these, uh, the idea to uh, camouflage themselves uh, very uh, uh, well, even during the day, right? When you think, well, it's like, you know, like great horn owl, it's a huge bird, <laughs> like a four or five foot wingspan. And you'll walk right by them because they're so well camouflaged and silent. Um, but then also you want to look at, okay, what is this animals or plants relationships with other living beings? Um, so owl, uh, great horn owls, they eat a lot of skunk, right? Okay, so then this is a way when I talk about how when you look at symbols, you're looking through that symbol to the intelligence behind. You're also looking through that symbol to its relationship to, to other symbols, right? Um, so if you're seeing, uh, yeah, let's see, if you're seeing a lot of skunks, but you feel like you could use uh, owl wisdom, right? Well, skunks feed owls, right? Um, so there is an intense relationship there. Uh, this is a way to uh, understand relationships. I mean, it's good just to understand your local ecology for any number of reasons, but it also, uh, from a magical perspective, um, if you're in a... <sighs> There's a lot of people that, that like uh, high ritual magic and stuff, and it's very uh, gorgeous and exciting and, it, you know, requires a lot of study and everything, but also it gets like real super persnickety about you need exactly this, you need that. And it's like these crazy things like a lion skin or something. And where are we going to get that here? The way I was taught as far as this ecological uh, perspective, uh, it's very useful if you uh, need to get things done, but you don't necessarily have a lot of resources, right? You can find your way through with your desire um, your contemplation, uh, thinking and observing, you can find your way through to what you need, even if it looks like you're kind of shit out of luck, <laughs> right? It reminds me, and I'm going to, um, it, but I do want to make the caveat again before I wrap up that uh, if you're working with, uh, with another tradition that already exists, especially people who kind of marginalize, just be respectful and uh, don't shoot your mouth off, mouth off. Uh, you know, ask questions without being, you know, obnoxious about it. Um, uh, try and, and research what you can and find out as opposed to just going, oh, I discovered this great thing that I ripped off these people and now I'm gonna try and make money off of this. It's just really gross. And hopefully it will bite you in the ass. Um, but uh, as I was going to say, you can, I wanted to leave you with this, and it's kind of an ecology uh, 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 insight into a, a symbol. This was, um, I got in online beef. I, I do get in beefs online, so if you see, see that, 
<laughs> I'm far from a perfect person. Um, but it, this is kind of one of the goofier ones. So uh, Carl Jung, I want to call him that guy. He was like a philosopher and a psychologist and an artist and a psychonaut. Uh, said some very interesting things. He was a Western European, earlier part of the 20th century, and he has this interesting, uh, fascinating, evocative quote about, you know, if you want to reach up to the heavens, you know, you can only reach up as far as your uh, roots go down to hell. I don't think he said to hell, but, you know, into the, the shadow part, because he's very concerned with the shadow uh, part of our consciousness. Um which is rooted in a particular type of ecology where you have these kind of individualistic, individual individual trees, and uh, they have to um, anchor themselves through these deep roots because of the type of soil, the conditions there, the particular tree that they are. Um, but I'm here in California, and we actually have the world's tallest trees here, redwoods, the sequoias, which are uh, incredible. But the fascinating thing is that they are able to attain uh, such great heights that they have without deep roots at all. They have a shallow root system, but they grow in groups and they intertwine their roots with one another and they hold each other up. So you can see the sim symbolism and the ecology there. If you are, um, okay, I'm going to say it. If you're like a white, well-educated, well-connected uh guy in Western Europe in the early part of the 20th century and you have a decent amount of money, you can do all that on your own, although actually he didn't. But, um, you know, in a lot of other areas, people get around this, uh, you know, and get forward, uh, deal with problems that they have um, and are able to access resources through their relationships with other people um, and other beings. So I would like to leave you on that note and uh, just know that, um, you know, it's possible that uh, meaning is inherent, but it's also assigned. Um, and you'll find that different ecologies, different cultures, different individual people will have different meanings that uh, they have noticed or developed or charged into certain symbols. Um, so... I would say just try and be mindful of when you're uh, finding a symbols coming up for you or you want to work with it. Um, what's the history around that? What are the relationships and kind of uh, life story of how that, that symbol tends to go? Um, what is the general uh, culture or whatever that, that symbol seems to be living in? Um, and take that into account if you find that you're getting a very uh, particular personal symbol coming up and uh, your version uh, has a particular meaning or kind of a cadence to it that seems at odds with uh, the symbol uh, universe that you thought you were working in, because there's a ton of different symbol universes out there, and they all have their own logic. Um, so hopefully this is a little helpful. It is a big topic, um, and a lot of it comes down to personal experience, but... Um, yeah, uh, have fun, try and be safe, but not too safe. <laughs> no guts, no glory.